Amen. Grab a seat, guys. Grab a seat. I mean, it's worth me mentioning. Oh, I can't tell. I'm super excited. My bad. Hey, how you doing? You all right? Bless y'all. Excellent. Good to see you. Excellent. Ah, oh, bless him. Well, welcome to church. Welcome to church. So tonight, you know, I've, I've got some books here. Um, sometimes I sell these books, but for you guys tonight, I'm going to give them away. Isn't that good news? Oh, that's at least one or two of you. Oh, hey, yes, come on. Shabba. Um, these books, are, this is my second book that I've written. Um, I'm going to explain a bit more about that in a little while. It sort of mingles in with a preach. But, uh, man, I feel like I should calm down a little bit. Um, I really enjoyed that worship. You know what I'm saying? I really did enjoy that. We was watching... Um, I think I was watching the news before we came out tonight, and um, and there was this like elephant. There's one of these adverts, you know, like, give money to the elephants. And and uh, Liam turned around and said, that elephant could just rip that thing out of the floor, couldn't he? That he's chained up to, you know, could just walk away. He's strong enough, isn't he? And uh, it just it just got me thinking, you know, um, it's a bit like God's power in us. You know, the Bible says that the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you and me. If you're a believer today and you've been baptised in God's Holy Spirit, then the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in me and, me and you. And, um, and it's, it's a bit like we're like this elephant that's like been chained up by, by the foot and the chain's like this little minion thing called doubt. And, uh, and then we're like, man, doubt's holding me back. I can never escape from this place into faith. And then, and then there's this elephant with all this power, and it's just like, you can walk out to, in, in, into the big old blooming jungle if it wants to, but, and live in freedom. And we're like that, you know, we're like, well, maybe I'm more like an elephant, elephant than more people, but, you know, we're, 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 like, we're like this elephant with all this power, and we're held captive by like, this little chain, which is basically nothing. And the chain is actually called doubt. And maybe if we just reach out and say, you know what, we're going to smash that down, we're going to break that chain, then maybe we can walk into the same stuff as what Jesus promised. You know, Jesus actually said, you, you know in the Bible it says Jesus, um, Jesus raised the dead, and he made blind eyes see, and he, and he, and he made deaf ears hear, and he did loads of amazing miracles. In fact, at one point he, he got a, a few like, loaves and fish, and, and, he, and he broke them and, and made them go between 5,000 men plus women and children, which could be 10, 15,000 people. And, um, and then he turns around and he says, but you, my disciples, that's me and you, by the way, if you're following Jesus tonight, me, you're, you, my disciples, you will see more than this in your life. And I'm just like, wow. And, uh, and, and there's just been this, uh, this amazing guy who's retired recently called Renard Bonke, and I've been looking at his life, and uh, this guy, he, he preached in Africa to like a million people at a time. And, uh, and, and uh, yeah, there's, there's one moment he, he tells this story of when uh, six or seven witches or something, uh, all like witch doctors and stuff, gathered around the camp where they were doing this massive church meeting and they were, they were trying to like command demons and stuff to kill him. And in foreign countries that sort of stuff happens. We don't see it very much, but over there it happens, it really does. And, um, and, and the story goes that as they started preaching and singing and praising, the witches started dying. One, two free instead of the preacher dying. It's like, what? You know, because God is so good. Uh, there's another story of a, of a time when, when a, a lady whose son or something like that had died, and so she brings him along to the, to the meeting in Africa and, uh, and puts him underneath the stage where Bonk is preaching and the boy comes back to life. It's like, what? How does that happen? We just don't see it over here, do we? But maybe we can if we just get rid of that little stupid chain called doubt. Yeah. Anyhow, let me preach. Is that all right? Not I haven't started already. I'm looking at Acts chapter 19, if you're interested. Uh, if you've got a Bible you want to turn to it, if you've got a Bible on your phone, I know some of you guys have that. Um, if you've got a hard copy, then great. If you haven't got any Bible and you want one, then let us know and I will find you one. So, Acts chapter 19. I'm going to try not to preach for too long tonight. Um, I'm preaching to believers tonight. And if you're not a believer, then, uh, then maybe, just maybe, uh, before we get into this, um, we might have a chance for you to become a believer. What I mean by that is you, uh, if you're not born again, the Bible says, uh, Jesus said in, in John chapter 3, if you want to see the kingdom of God, then you must be born again. And so we'll talk about that in a little while. But before I get there, I want to encourage you with some other stuff. Is that all right? Oh, well done. Thanks, mate. Um, okay, Acts chapter 9, it says this, it says, And it happened that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul passed through the inland country of, uh, and came to 
Ephesus. There he found some disciples. These are people that already follow Jesus. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they said, no. We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptised? They said, into John's baptism. And Paul said, John baptised with the baptism of repentance, that's saying sorry to God. Telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptised in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. And they began speaking in tongues and prophesying. There were about 12 men in all. Yeah? So these people are trying to follow the way, essentially. They are uh, Christians. Uh, there's already been preachers go through there. Um, in fact, a few uh, is it before this, I think it might well be, uh, there's, a, there's a little revival that happens in Ephesus. Is that right? Is that before chapter 19 or after? Oh, is it after? It could well be after, I don't know. I should have read my Bible before I came out, but I've got it even thought I'm going to preach on that tonight. Anyhow, <laughs> the point being that, um, that these lads have, uh, have all made uh, some sort of commitment. They want to follow God. And, uh, and they're trying their hardest to follow them, I'm guessing. And, uh, and it comes to this point in time where, um, where this guy comes along and starts talking about this Holy Spirit. Now, I just want to ever so slightly, ever so quickly teach you about what makes us Pentecostal and what makes us any other uh, type of Christian. So, most Christians um, in, the, in the modern sort of, we call it charismatic world, those that uh, see miracles and, and, and do wonders for God and all that sort of stuff, uh, most uh, of these guys we might call charismatic and, and what they will believe is that when we are saved, when we're born again at that moment, the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you are filled with his power and with the ability to do lots of different things. For example, speaking in tongues is one, which is like a foreign language, like an every language. Another is to pray for the sick. Another one might be to prophesy, another one, in fact some, some of the gifts of the Holy Spirit are really wide ranging, there's so many of them, I think there's 30 listed in the New Testament, one of them is serving, you know, so coming out and putting out the chairs before church, that's a gift of the Holy Spirit, believe it or not. But, um, but the point here is that there's a subsequent baptism in the Holy Spirit, so you believe this is the way that we, we, we see this. What happens is you start to believe you're, you're born again. And then at some point, that's like, your, that's like your first crisis moment. So what happens is you realise, whoa, hang on a minute. I'm not following God. I'm going to go somewhere that I don't want to go after I die. Hell. Yeah, we can say that. We're in church today, by the way. Um, I'm going to go to hell if I don't accept Jesus, my Lord and Saviour. So, so, so we come to that choice. We come to that manic crazy moment where we're like oh, I can't believe it, God is real and I really want to follow him, in fact for me personally it's like I fell in love with him, not like uh, like a sexual relationship but I fell in love with him like he was my dad it's like I'd never met my dad before and all of a sudden I've met my dad and I was like ah oh, wow, this is the most amazing feeling of just awe and, and worship and just praise and, and I, I, just, I just fell in love with him and I wanted to follow him that's like our first crisis moment. And a guy called John Wesley, who started the Methodist uh, denomination, said that he had a secondary crisis moment where he called out because he realised that he wasn't holy. Do you know what I mean by holy? What I mean is he was following God, but yet his life didn't match up with the New Testament version of a Christian. Yeah? So he wasn't living a holy life. So... He might have been swearing, for example. Not that that's, I don't think that's massively bad, but to him it may have been really bad. And he might have thought, wow, I'm not supposed to live like that. Maybe he might have looked at some women, I don't think he did, but maybe that might have been something that he struggled with, he might have struggled with lust. You know, he might have struggled with all sorts of different things. He could have struggled with anger. In fact, there's a really great preacher from, from, from the olden days, about 100 years ago, called Smith Wigglesworth. And, uh, and the story goes that he became a Christian and started praying for people. And people started getting healed here and there, just sporadically. Uh, and, uh, and, and he, and he realised about this thing called the Holy Spirit. And, and, and he prayed and he prayed and he prayed. In fact, he sat outside uh, this vicar's house 
for about three months or something like that, waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And, um, and, and in the end, the vicar's wife got extremely frustrated and came outside and prayed for him. And he received this gift of the Holy Spirit, this subsequent baptism. And when he went home, he, he sat speaking in tongues to his wife. And his wife was like, I don't care about the tongue, Smith. I want to see some real power. Show me the real power. And within a few months, uh, she, she had said this. She said, he always used to get angry with me. And I could never make him happy. But ever since that moment, I've never been able to make him angry again. And that's because he was baptised in the Holy Spirit and he was made holy by God. And that's, 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 that's what we call sanctification. He, he, he became more sanctified. He became uh, like he started acting more like Jesus. Does that make sense? So one of the good things of the Holy Spirit is that he makes us holy. Yeah? And how we know we need him, one of the ways is that we're not holy ourselves. Yeah? So we have this crisis moment. Wow, I'm meant to be following Jesus, but for some weird reason, my life doesn't match up with what it's meant to match up with. And we have this secondary, subsequent moment of crisis when we decide we need the Holy Spirit, when we hear about the Holy Spirit. Okay, does that make sense? So that's the doctrine, the teaching, the theology of um, of the Pentecostal Church. We believe in subsequent baptism. Yeah? Um, and it does, it makes us holy. Um, to give you an idea of what this means for myself, um, when I first became a Christian, where one of the first things that God told me was, I must love my wife. And uh, I'd never done that before. Uh, we weren't very good friends, actually. In fact, we almost hated each other. And, um, and uh, I remember saying to God, I will do anything for you, God. I will do anything. And then I said, just send someone along in my path to pray for me who's a, who's a stranger and they can tell me what I should do. You know, and then, um, and then I think it was my pastor to him and I said, Darren, I really think you should learn to look after your wife. I was like, okay, okay, Jason. Yeah, yeah, sure. And I, the whole time I was thinking, but what does God want me to do? Uh, because apparently looking after one wasn't good enough uh, at that moment in time. I wanted something really powerful to do. And, um, and then I went to this big conference in Bradford and I prayed that prayer again. God, send a stranger to pray over my life who doesn't know me, who can tell me what you want. And I, and I stood there at the front of the church and I had, had my hand, hand, hands held out like this, saying, God, I really want to hear from you. And a total stranger came up to me and said, um, said hey, can I pray for you? And I said, yeah, sure. He goes, what should I say, Darren? He goes, he goes, God, I pray that Darren would learn to look after his wife really well. And I thought, wow, that's amazing. Jason said that too. What does God really want me to do? Uh, and, and then uh, I'm sitting in a men's prayer meeting on a Friday night, and uh, I'm around all these people that are total strangers, and I hear this thick African accent. And I haven't really introduced myself because I was late that night. And, um, and uh, this guy started praying, Lord, I pray that Darren would learn to look after his wife, Laura. And I thought, wow, if that's not clear, I don't know what is. So after the meeting, I turned around to the, the, the guy who I thought it was, and I said, listen, mate, um, thank you so much for praying for me. By the way, my name's Darren. You prayed for me and my wife earlier? And he said, no, I didn't. I was like, yeah, he did. Uh, you, I heard you say Darren and Laura. And then I said, you heard him, didn't you? And I was like, no, no, I didn't, I didn't, didn't even hear Darren and Laura. I don't know what you're on about. And, uh, and, and I asked all around the room, and I went, no, 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 I didn't hear that. I, I believe to this day that it was like God speaking to me with an African accent, which is quite weird, but anyway, uh, really loudly, like I'm speaking to you guys now, or out loud. And, uh, and from that point on, I thought, you know, um, I think my first ministry needs to be to love my wife. And I'm still learning that to that well now, by the way. I'm not perfect to that either. But, um, but that's one thing that changed in my life. Another thing that happened when, uh, when I first became a Christian was, um, I, um, I, I used to really struggle with the women thing. You know, like looking at women, all that sort of stuff. And, um, and I, was, I, was, I remember I was just praying, God, I, was, I, was, I feel so guilty about this sin, this lust. I feel so guilty about it. Would you, would you take it away from me, please? Please take it away. And I prayed and I prayed. And, um, and then I, I was driving up this really busy road in Northampton called Ketchum Road. And, um, and I, it was about two weeks after, and I looked out the window of the, of the van, and I saw this young lady that I went to school with. And I thought, oh, that's Katie. And I thought, actually, that's the first female I've noticed in about two weeks. 
It's like my brain had just switched off to the female form, and it was just people. It was no longer male, female, it was just people. And God had taken that sin away from me, and I've never struggled with it since. You know what I mean? I'm like, what? It's unbelievable. God is so good at making us holy. And obviously, uh, my anger, my anger, that started disappearing. And I think, I think the Holy Spirit directed me towards a counsellor. And uh, having counselling helped me to get rid of that anger. Does that make sense? So the Holy Spirit has made me holy and he wants to make you holy too. Second point is that the Holy Spirit wants to endow you with power. With power. He wants to give you the power of heaven. The Bible says that you can do the same things that Jesus did. If you're a believer today, then you are, you are invited to be baptised into God's Holy Spirit, at which point you are filled with the same power that Jesus had, which means that if you are, who was it? It was, it was uh, young Leanne. You know, and this isn't just me. I, I, sometimes I do these preaches, and I do these sort of preaches all over the country, and um, and then sometimes I, I, I quite often tell all the times when I've seen someone healed through my ministry, and uh, and it's like, oh yeah, Darren's awesome. Darren's a superstar. Actually, you know what? You can do it too. Leanne prayed for her, her mum who had migraines. She's like 14 years old. Leanne is, um, and uh, and her mum stopped getting headaches. You know, and then and then later on she prayed for her dad and her dad got healed and she prayed for someone else and they got I think she prayed for Leah who's now popped into the other room writing an article for us. But Leah, she prayed for Leah and Leah got healed. And this is Leah who's got fourteen. You know, and then and then I'm sure you guys have probably prayed for prayed for people in the past and they've, they've been healed. There's a moment where Liam and uh, Ben sat at the back of our other church, uh, probably about three years ago, and um, and I was talking about healing. And I was saying, why don't you pray for someone who's near you and needs healing? And Leo and Ben looked at each other, they prayed for each other, and both of them got healed. Isn't that amazing? You know what I mean? Because, because God puts the power in you, not just Darren, by the way. Although I have some of my own personal stories. Let me just tell you one or two, okay? So, number one, um, has anyone ever struggled with alcohol before? Has anyone ever? Like, I used to be, like, basically an alcoholic, you know? Um, I still say basically, I'm still like, wouldn't be an alcoholic. Laura would be like, you were an alcoholic. You drank every day, you drank a lot every day. Um, so let's just say I was an alcoholic, right? But um, God healed me of that. And, um, and I was in uh, Worcester once, and there's this guy called Arthur. Arthur was a Colombian guy who had um, who'd, like, killed someone at war in Colombia, and he's like, um, he really, really depressed and struggling with that in his life, and it drove him to drink a lot of alcohol. And he came to church, and um, interestingly, um, it was a really funny week, it was really weird. I was speaking on healing again, and uh, particularly about this woman, and, and, and his wife was going through the same thing. Or his girlfriend, sorry, was going through the same thing. Anyway, so I prayed for her at the front of the church, and then he came up to me out the back, and he was crying, and he said, he said, he said Darren, he says, um, I drink, and I drink, and I drink, and I can't stop, I'm like, I just can't stop drinking. Please give me help. And um, I don't know why I said it, but I feel, I, I, I sort of said, well, I think you might need deliverance from alcoholism. That means if alcohol is like a, a leech that sucks the life out of you, then God wants to take away the leech and cast it out. Does that make sense? And so I said to him, can I pray for deliverance for you? And he said, yes, please do. And so me and my friend Sam, we sat there and we prayed for him. We prayed for deliverance from alcoholism, and um, and uh, about eight or nine days later, I spoke to him. He goes, "Darren, I haven't touched alcohol for like four days." I was like, "Wow, that's amazing!" I, I didn't really believe him uh, because sometimes people just say things to make you feel good, don't they? Um, but then I was driving down the road in Worcester, driving through one of the main streets, and uh, I saw him walking through the street with a Costa coffee in his hands instead of a can of links. I thought, "Hey, up!" I've just been healed. Woo! Yeah, come on, Shabbat. And I've seen them a few more times since then as well. Another person, um, my friend the other week, uh, sent me a message on Facebook. He said, hey, Darren, do you remember that day, like five years ago, when, when uh, I, I said I needed healing from eczema? I had it all over my body. And you prayed for me, and you put some anointing oil on me and prayed for me. Because I just realised, I've never told you, I got healed from eczema. I'm like, wow, that's amazing, isn't it? That's just... That's like a friend, you know, a Bible college. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? Eczema, you know, there's, a, there's an old story about this guy who, who ministered to travellers, and um, he was a traveller himself. And, um, and he was, um, I can't remember exactly what happened, but he went into this travellers camp, and, um, and 
There's people wanting prayer and that sort of healing, and there's one guy who his skin was like scales all over his whole body, like he's like really I don't know if it's dry, I don't, he must have had some sort of skin disease or some sort of weird thing. Um, anyway, so so this traveller guy prays for him and uh, and, and says that he, he God healed this man, and you know, and uh, and this is like one of the sort of elders of the camp, and um, and and anyway, so the old boy goes back into us and he's standing there and he's got out the shower. And he's drying himself, and he looks down, and there's there's scales all over the floor, and uh, and he looks in the mirror, and, and his skin is just perfect, and it's just like he's got perfect skin. Scales are over the floor. All of the traveller camp obviously then want to know all about Jesus. You know what I mean? And I think that's what it's all about, isn't it? These things, these these power moments, are like signs that point the way to Jesus. Um, let me tell you a couple more. Is that all right? These ones are about prophecy. Is that all right? And then I'm gonna pray. Is that alright? And we're gonna I'm gonna offer you the opportunity, firstly, um, to follow Jesus if you haven't already made that choice. And secondly, I want to give you the opportunity to receive, to receive the Holy Spirit. And uh, I'll give you a book as well. Is that alright? Not because you're receiving the Holy Spirit, but because I want to know a little bit more about it. Is that alright? Uh, cool. Happy days. So, so Two stories, yeah? I've got Worcester written down here. Uh, there must have been a few things that happened in Worcester. But, um, but there was a... Actually, you know what? Let's, um, let's go for um, Evesham. There's a little church in Evesham, the Leland Church, that one of my friends runs. And, um, and he asked me to go and preach there one time. And, and uh, as I'm like, going to preach, sometimes I've prayed the, morning, the night before and I go, God, what are the four or five things that you want me to say? So this was what happened, what, two weeks ago in here? I asked God, God, what are four or five good things you want me to say? Uh, you know, so there was like sciatica, and there was something about someone having panic attacks, and there's a few things, do you remember that? And, um, and there's like someone here that had panic attacks, and then actually there were two people online who suffered with sciatica who wanted me to pray for them as well. But amazing moment. So I'm in um, Evesham, and I'm doing this thing called prophecy, and um, I get this feeling that I should say James. I'm like, oh man, oh, there's someone called James in the church, who was asking me really weird. Um, so I'm standing there, and um, and I, I just um, I was like, God, you know, I'm not actually going to say the name James until my stomach turns upside down and inside out because that's a big ask. If you shout out James in church and there's no one called James, you know, you're a false prophet. And then uh, you know, according to the Bible, you're meant to be taken out, stone, taken outside and stoned. You know, what be the first one been stoned, James? You know what I mean? So um, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that sort of stone. You know what I'm saying? Not. Not bricks. Anyhow, anyhow, <laughs> anyhow. So, um, so I thought, you know, God, I'll, I'll, I'll say James, but only when I really feel in my gut that it's time to say that. And um, and there's this one point where this woman comes forward. Uh, I pray for loads and loads of people, and this woman comes forward, and she says the words prophesy over me. At which point, she's essentially saying, speak the word of God over my life, and if you don't get it right, I'm going to call you out. Yeah, that's essentially what I felt she was saying. And at that point, you can imagine my stomach went inside out and upside down. So I went, do you know someone called James? And she went, yeah, that's my brother. I went, what? I went, unbelievable. I said, we should pray for James. So I started praying for James. And then, um, and then as it happens, um, actually, sometimes, um, did you know that your body sort of, um, sort of reacts to emotions? Did you know that? So sometimes if you're really massively stressed, does anyone get like a, a tight shoulder, you know? Or um, to get like a little sty in your eye or anything like that. Do anyone get that? And your eyes start flickering, anyone get any of that sort of stuff? Um, did you know that? Uh, anxiety actually affects your stomach. Did you know that? Uh, physically affects your stomach. So, um, and I started getting this weird stomach ache. So I said to her, I feel like God's given me a pain for you. Um, do you suffer with anxiety? I feel like God is saying that you're scared to be in your own home. And she was just like, she just fell onto her knees and started crying out to God. You know, as far as as far as prophecies go, that's pretty personal, isn't it? You know, and then, and uh, you know, she's already a Christian. She didn't, didn't need to give love to the Lord. She just needed to know that God had her back. You know what I mean? But it's just an amazing moment. I'm sure some of you guys have already experienced a bit of prophecy. Here's another one. Painton. Oh yeah, I was in Painton uh, in Devon. And um, and I was, uh, I was I was doing this sort of stuff again, and there's a big old church full of people, and uh, and I felt God say um, that someone has been bitten by a dog. That's a bit of a weird one, isn't it? Someone has been bitten by a dog, and now they're scared to walk around the streets. 
So I thought, well, let's say it. Let's say it. See what God's, you know, that's faith, isn't it? Saying it is the faith, you know. So I said it, and this young girl, 14 years old, on the front row said, that's me, that's me, that's me. So obviously we then we prayed for her to be delivered from fear and to live in love. You know what I'm saying? So, so, so these moments, these prophecy, this healing, this, these other gifts that the Holy Spirit gives us uh, are, are from the, the Holy Spirit as we're baptised. Yeah? Do you want to know what the word baptism means? So I want to tell you that before, before I conclude this little preach. Is that right? Baptism, you might think, what does that even mean? Actually, it means to be saturated. Saturated. So if you can imagine, you've got sponge. And, uh, and if you just hold a sponge that's dry and dunk it in water and bring it back out, you, you're barely going to have any water coming out, are you? Do you know what I mean? But if you ever like, got a sponge, squeezed it, and then put it into water, and then when you let go of it in the water, all the water gets sucked into it, doesn't it? Anyone ever play with sponges like that? That's just me, I'm a bit weird, am I? Okay. <laughs> but it does, doesn't it? it like, when you squeeze a sponge in the water, the water goes right to the middle of it when you let it go under there, and that's saturation. And so life itself is a bit like, it's a bit like a hand squeezing you as a sponge. And essentially what I'm saying is if we just take a moment in God's presence to say, I want to be saturated by you, God, by your Holy Spirit, then the first thing, the first outcome will be you become more holy. The second will be that you will be filled with power from on high. I never preach um, just for the sake of preaching. It's not something I think you should do. I always preach in order to help you to respond to God in a certain way. And so tonight, um, although I know there's not many of us, but that's fine, that's okay. Um, I want to give you the opportunity to respond to God. So, so I'm, I'm acutely aware that there's a real good possibility that there are people in the room who aren't even born again. Yeah? And if you're not born again, it's a bit hard for you to have the Holy Spirit because he just can't stand, he can't stand sin. God sees sin like muck. Can I say, yeah, muck's all right to say in church, isn't it? God sees sin like muck. It's, a, it's, like, it's like for him to put his hand on your shoulder when you're not following Jesus, it's literally like for him to put his hand down the toilet. And so if you're covered in sin, which all of us are, the Bible says all of us are covered in it, then the only way that the Holy Spirit is ever going to come and saturate you is if you're sinless. Now the Bible says that what makes you sinless as a believer is that Jesus takes your sin upon himself. He takes your sin upon himself. So, in the olden days, before Jesus, the routine would be this. They would get a bull or something like that, a bull or a cow or sheep or something like that, and they would grab the horns of the bull and they would put their head against the bull's head and spiritually they would pass over the sin onto the bull and then they would kill the bull, thus killing the sin. Yes. Yeah? Does that make sense? In the New Testament, God essentially has said, your sacrifices, because they're done in vain, mean nothing to me. Nothing. You can't go killing bulls no more. Instead, I will send the Lamb of God, Jesus, who is perfect in every way, to die for your sins. And the deal is, the deal is, that for your sins to be forgiven, you simply have to pass them on to him, spiritually. Does that make sense? So you pass your sin on to Jesus, and then Jesus, who died 2,000 years ago, once and for all, so the Bible says, for all the past sins, all the present sins, all the sins to come, it says that at that point, your sin dies with him, which makes you holy and clean and free from sin. So, firstly, in terms of tonight, you can receive the Spirit. Yeah, which is good news on earth, isn't it? Secondly, one day, you get to go to heaven. That's even better news, isn't it? Yeah, come on. So, what we're going to do is, is we're going to have two responses. The first response is this. I want to follow Jesus. I want to pass my sin onto him, thus relieving me of sin. I want to pass my burden onto him. 
and then you'll be born again, the Bible says. Okay? If that's you, then I'm going to say a prayer. It's a really simple free, free sentence prayer that you just need to follow. Just say it from your heart. You can even say it out loud if you really want. And then the Bible says that once you've accepted him, you'll be made whole, you'll be made clean, you'll be made fresh. Isn't that good news? In fact, it says you'll be like a new creation. So we're going to do that first um, to make way for the Holy Spirit, for anybody that isn't saying thing. Is that all right? So if you want to close your eyes, we're going to go through three sentences. Are you ready? So you can say these out loud, you can say them in the depth of your heart. God, I'm sorry for the things that I've done to hurt you. Jesus, take my sin. I choose to follow you. God, help me to follow you for the rest of my life. Amen. Amen. And now if you've said that prayer, there's no reason why you can't be baptised in the Holy Spirit, which is exciting. And some of us have said that prayer before, of us obviously it's our first time today. Whichever way it is, it's cool, it's fun. Welcome to the kingdom, by the way, if that's your first time. You're now a son of God or daughter of God, which is good news, isn't it? Um, in a second, I'm going to give out these books so you get to know God who is with us all the time a little bit better. But before we do that, I want to invite you to be baptised in God's Holy Spirit. Now, this is for all Christians. You don't have to be anything special. Um, I know I wasn't. I was a right one. I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure I said now. I wasn't the nicest of chaps even when I first became a Christian. But yet God still chose to reside in me. So if you would like to be baptised in the Spirit, then maybe we can just pray once more together. We're just going to say, Holy Spirit, Come into my life. Fill me afresh. Is that cool? So, um, so this is what we do. We can even stay seated, can we? Yeah. Chill out. Relax. You may feel a little bit woozy. Or a little bit dazed. Or sometimes people feel drunk when the Holy Spirit comes into their lives. That's normal. In fact... The Bible says, don't get drunk on wine, but get drunk on the Holy Spirit. So if anything, it encourages you to get drunk on the Spirit. That's good news, isn't it? So let's um, open our hearts to God, shall we? And I'm going to pray that prayer myself. The Bible says to keep on being filled with the Spirit. And so I want to be filled too. Let's pray, shall we? You can pray your own prayer. Again, in your heart or out loud. 